the 33rd Psalm. I'm reading once again from the English Standard Version. It's just become one of my favorite uh, versions. Um, but here's how the 33rd Psalm reads, beginning at verse 1 um, from the English Standard Version. Uh, the psalmist writes, Shout for joy in the Lord, O you righteous. Praise benefits the upright. Give thanks to the Lord with the lyre. Make melody to him with the harp of ten strings. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully on the strings with loud shouts. Um, when my children were very young, I used to uh, play a game with them. Uh, when they were riding with just me and Cynthia wasn't in the car with us, uh, I would tell them that we were not in a car, we were in a spaceship. And I was the captain. And I was driving the ship. Uh, they would be in the back seat and I would tell them, you are the crew. And so I would yell out something like, um, batten down the hatches. Discombobulate the discombobulator. And uh, my uh, kids would say, okay, daddy. And I would say, I am not your daddy. I am the captain of the ship. You will address me as sir. Yes, sir. And they would giggle with delight. And they'd say, sir, yes, sir. I remember one time, uh, my son, my oldest son, he says, daddy. He says, what's a hatches? And I said, I don't know, but batten it down. Another time I, I, I yelled back and said something like, uh, actually I didn't yell, I called back and said something like, uh, unstrap the striptula strapist. And, and my son said, Daddy, you, you didn't yell at us. You, you need to yell at us. Please yell at us. As they got older, they didn't want me to yell at them anymore. That didn't last. One time I... Um, uh, and you may have done this as a parent when your children are young. I was walking, about to walk past the room, and I heard uh, them in there uh, debating as to who loved Daddy the most. And uh, I just thought that was uh, so cute. One thing, in hindsight, that I'm glad that they were not debating, and that is, number one, uh, who their Daddy loved the most, because it would have been a tie. You love them all the same. And the other thing that I'm glad that they were not uh, debating is that none of them had an ounce of doubt that their father loved them unconditionally. And perhaps because of those times of playing, I've got a reputation for being a father who joked all the time, who would run in when they were asleep and jump on their beds and wake them up and things like that. That was me. It, it, it just worked with the kids and, and, and they giggled. It didn't work when I did it with Cynthia. Um, <laughs> sometimes when they're together now as adults, they, they will talk about, they'll, they'll sing my praises about what kind of father I was. I don't think I was that, you know, great a father deserving all of that praise, but sometimes uh, they sing my praises, perhaps because of all the fun and, and all of those moments that they remember. But the, the best thing that Cynthia and I did for our children is to teach them that there's another father who deserves worship and praise because that father brings joy. That father has a love that is unconditional. That father has a love that is greater than the love of their father than it could ever be. The psalmist knew something about this. He is an anonymous writer. We don't know who wrote the psalm, but he must have already come to know this, and that's why he encourages believers to yell at the father. Like I would yell out to the kids. Look, look in verse 1 again. He says, shout for joy in the Father. He, he says in verse 2, give thanks to the Father. In, in verse 3, he says, sing to the Father. And I'd like to suggest to you is, is that the Father loves to hear you yell to him. First, 
Yell out to the Father in worship. Yell out to the Father in worship. Look at verse 1 again. He says, shout for joy in the Lord. O you righteous praise benefits the upright. First, yell out corporately. He uses that phrase, O you righteous. And he's using it in a plural sense. It means that uh, it gives the image or the impression of, of a group of people yelling out to him. Not, not just one, but it implies that these worshipers are, are yelling out to God. And it implies that our worship is not supposed to be uh, as casual observers. But worship is to be participatory. That, that you need to, whether you're yelling with your mouth or you're yelling from your heart, that you are participating in worship more exactly. It, it gives us the impression that they're shouting to him. Shout to the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. <laughs> Yell out corporately. Not only are we to shout, but, but look what he says, that, that those who are not good vocal shouters, because not everybody can shout uh, that well. We were uh, down in Hilton Head um, for this past summer. We try to go uh, each year. And uh, we, I love comedy. I love laughter. Uh, I hate that so much of it is, is so terrible that you can't, you know, you can't listen to it. But there's a group of Christian comedians, and we went to a comedy club uh, that billed itself as clean comedy. Um, I don't sit on the front row when I go to a comedy club, because you know if you do, you are the target. Um, but at some point, I got targeted anyway. And the comedian walks through the office, and he, or through the audience, and he says, so what do you do? You know, I would have been, he would have torn me to pieces. I said, I uh, help people. <laughs> I, was that a lie? I don't know. I don't, now that I think about it. And, and he tells me, he's doing this card trick, I think it was. I can't remember. And, and he told, tells me to pretend that I have a gun. And he goes up on stage and he says, now, when I count to three, I want you to shoot this. Make the loudest, you know, yell out. The shooting sound, you know, that, that is, symbolizes a gun, you know, it imitates a gun. And so he says, one, two, three, and I said, pow. And he says to the audience, wait a minute, how tall are you? you as big as you are, that's, he says, you sound like a, <laughs> he says, your voice is so high. Where's the big, deep voice? I yelled out to the best of my ability. Everybody doesn't yell the same. The psalmist knows this. He says, yell out to the Lord. And if you're not a good yeller, then he mentions here about playing. Look at verse 2 and 3 again. He says, give thanks to the Lord with the lyre. Make melody to him with the harp of ten strings. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully on the strings with loud shouts. I, I notice that he says, play skillfully. A after all, uh, we pay, and I know I do. I love music. You know I'm a music lover. I pay to hear some good music musicians play. There's nothing wrong with uh, demanding excellence in worship. There is something wrong when your desire to have excellence in worship overrides the object of our worship. But he says, play skillfully. So even the non-singer, even, even the mediocre musician can praise God, worship. They can be participatory. He says, new song. And it reminds me that God's mercies are new every day. That every day you have a reason to sing praises to God. This day is the day to sing praises to God because you will never see this day again. After this day is gone, you don't get it anymore. You get a new day and in that new day, worship the Lord. Yell out to him. So that if you were to slump over into death this very moment, people would have to look and say, well, one of the last things that they did before they slumped over into death was to yell out to the Lord in worship and praise. Yell out corporately. Yell out personally. The psalmist gives three reasons for yelling out in worship to the Lord. Let me give them to you quickly here. First, worship because worship uplifts the upright. I'm pulling it from verse 1 here. He says, praise benefits the upright. 
Here's how the New King James Version puts it. It says, praise from the upright is beautiful. And here's a case where I love the New International Version. It says, the same verse, translation reads, it is fitting for the upright to praise him. It almost implies that there's no way for a person to be a follower of Christ. There's no way for a person to be a lover of Jesus. There's no way for a person to be a person who loves God and not also be a worshiper. It doesn't say you have to be a loud worshiper. It doesn't say you have to be a dancing worshiper, although there are some of them who dance and worship in the word of God. But I think that you have to be a worshiper. How can you not worship the one who saves your soul? So first worship because it uplifts the upright. Because when you do worship, you feel good. It, 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 it's cleansing, man. Uh, before we came in today, I don't come in as early as I used to post-coronavirus. You know, you guys got everything, you know, you got all the hatches battened down. So I don't need to come in and batten down any hatches early as I used to. And so I come a little later on. I'm able to uh, sit with my wife a little bit before uh, coming in. Used to be I was out so early. She didn't see me. I didn't see any of them before I left on a Sunday morning. But we were just looking at worship. We were just YouTube from worship song to worship song. And there was this one group that was worshiping. I mean, the more they sang, the more excited they got to the point that we're just laughing and giggling like my children were in the back of that van as I said, call me, sir. Yes, sir. Because worship is infectious. It uplifts the upright. Here's the second thing. Worship because worship uplifts God. It's recognizing him for his uprightness. In verse 4, he says, for the word of the Lord is upright. It it is righteous. There was a time when the trophy only went to those who won the game. It's not the case anymore. Everybody gets a trophy. Everybody gets a prize. And isn't it something that God deserves a million trophies and some people refuse to give him even one? Worship because it is uplifting God for what he has done. Thirdly, worship because worship underscores our gratitude, thanking God for his faithfulness. The latter part of verse 4 says, and all his work is done in faithfulness. And this verse seems to be in response to the first three verses. The reason we are to shout, that's what he says in verse 1. The reason we are to give thanks, that's what he says in verse 2. And the reason that we are to sing, as he says in verse 3, is because we are grateful for his faithfulness. Worship him corporately. Worship him personally. And then yell out tenaciously. It it, it means to be resolute in worship. That means to determine to do it. Be a worshiper. It means to be unwavering in worship. It means be firm in your commitment to be a worshiper of our Savior. And thirdly, it means to be persistent in worship. Don't stop doing it, why should we be faithful in our worship to God? Why should we be uh, the type of persons who are shouting out, whether in our voice or our hearts, to God? Why should we do that? Answer, because he's the only one who can save your soul. Worship him. Here's my second main point. Yell out to the Father in amazement. Yell out to him in amazement. Be amazed at the things that God loves and then praise him for it. Look at verse 5. It says, he loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of the steadfast love of the Lord. He, He loves righteousness. He loves morality. He loves virtuousness. He loves honesty. He loves decency. Um, These are the things that seem to be dying out in our culture. And along with their slow demise goes patience and kindness and respect for one another. If you go to the airport, maybe you're flying out for uh, the holidays, uh, you need to know that you have to wear a mask when you go into the airport. If you get on the plane, you got to wear a mask. Now, the steward did not make the rule that you have to wear a mask. But it's their job to enforce it. Yet some people have lost mutual respect and common decency to the point that someone knocked the stewardess's teeth out 
because they didn't wear a mask. Another one breaks a, a stewardess's nose. You knew you had to wear a mask when you went to the airport. You don't want to wear it, don't go to the airport. What, what happened to decency? What, what happened to respect? If you can justify somebody doing that, then you might be devoid of recognizing what God loves. It says he loves righteousness, but it also says he loves justice. He loves fairness and impartiality and honesty. And perhaps the best way to to more fully understand justice is to look at the antonyms to justice. Of course, injustice and unfairness and discrimination and prejudice and bias and just plain wrongness. And when you find yourself leaning in the direction of those things and living your life that way, then you just may be leaning toward the things that God does not love. It says he loves righteousness. It says he loves justice. Be amazed by that and celebrate that. Here's another thought. Be amazed by what God has done and then yell out in praise to him for it. It seems clear that the psalmist is struck by the omnipotence of God. Uh, In verse 4, he has said, For the word of the Lord is upright and all his work is done in faithfulness. And it seems that the next verses, verses 6 through like 7 or 8, refer back to verse 4. Look at verse 6. He says, By the word of the Lord the heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth all their hosts. He gathers the waters of the sea as a heap. He puts the deep in storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. Verse 6, it says, by his word, he created the heavens. He mentions their host. That's the stars. We had this eclipse of the moon this past week. And if you were able to catch it on a clear night and look up, you couldn't help but to notice the stars. And if you did, you have to think to yourself, God made that. He made all the starry Host, and we cannot help but to reminded, be reminded of the words of the writer of Hebrews. He says in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 3, By faith, we understand that the universe was created by the word of God. That what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. In verse 7, he says, The seas in their massiveness and the depth of the ocean comes from water that is stored in storehouses. It's a reference to clouds that hold up water until God and his sovereignty allows it to be released. And then in verse 8, he says, as a result, we should be left awestruck. When's the last time you were awestruck by the greatness and the power of God? And let me just say this. If that's never happening in your walk with him, you need to check yourself. Because God is awesome. And if at some place in your life, some place, at some time, with whatever you may be dealing with, or even if it's just a great day, that you don't stop and say, God, you are awesome. You need to check yourself. Yell out to him. Yell out to the Father in amazement. Not only is God's work awesome, but it is stable. Look at verse 9. He says, for he spoke, and it came to be. He commanded, and it stood Firm, there is a strength and an orderliness and a harmony uh, to the visible things of earth, to the universe, to the stars in the heavens. And that's all because there is an intelligent designer that is behind it all. There's a creator, God, whose power is seen in the existence of all the awesome things that he has made. That is until the appointed time uh, when God decides to tear down and pluck up. And destroy because that day is coming too. But it's not a day for us to fear if we were our followers of Christ because God is a keeper. And there's one day he will catch us away to keep us with him for an eternity. Yell out. Here's a third one. Yell out to the Father prospectively. It it means to think about the future. It means to do it um, 
More than introspectively, it means to, to, to consider the future as you yell out to the Father. Within the context of, of, of our message here, it, it means to yell out in consideration of the sovereignty of God. And this, the psalmist recognizes it. God is, first of all, sovereign on an international level. Look at verse 33, or verse 10. He says, the Lord brings the counsel of the nations to nothing. He frustrates the plans of the people. The nation who wants to maintain a position of power and authority and might, they have to continue to cultivate and to to, uh, get stronger and to increase their might. And the psalmist seems to say that the nation who plans and strategizes and attempts to increase their might apart from God is going to fail. The rise of empire after empire has proven that it's no match for the sovereignty of God. There's the Babylonian empire, there's the Assyrian empire, there's the Medo empire, there's the Persian empire, there's the Medes and the Persians as they came together. There's the Greek empire, which lasted something around 350 years. One of the longest lasting empires is is the Roman empire, over a thousand years. Years and the influence of the Greek and Roman Empire are still felt today. At one time, the British uh, was the empire covering a fourth of the, of the land mass of the earth and, and a fourth of the people of the earth. But the Greek Empire fell. The Roman Empire fell. The British Empire is no longer the power that it was. They fell. And today, America is the empire to be reckoned with. But if you make your plans, if you try to increase your might apart from God, you will fail. I love what our brother said uh, last evening when he spoke in our anchor summit. He says, I know some of you aren't going to like this. He said, but there is no American flag flying in heaven. Think about that. If it makes you mad, just go ahead and walk out. But when you get home, turn on the message so you can see the rest of it. (laughs) In contrast to holding a godless strategy, the psalmist suggests faithfulness to God. God is also sovereign on on a universal level. Look at verse 11. He says, the counsel of the Lord stands forever. The plans of his heart To all generations, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people whom he has chosen as his heritage. A reference to the nation of Israel is clearly alluded to here. Nevertheless, blessing also holds true for any nation that will allow their plans and their might to be governed by the Lord. Look look at verse 13. He says, the Lord looks down from heaven. He sees all the children of man from where he sits enthroned. He looks out on all the inhabitants of earth. He who fashions the hearts of them all and observes all their deeds. And there's one more thought here. I love this here. Jump down to verse 16 now. He says, the king is not saved by his great army. A warrior is not delivered by his great strength. The war horse is a false hope for salvation, and by its great might, it cannot rescue. We have fearless uh, soldiers. We have powerful weapons. We have advanced military intelligence, yet the psalmist intimates that absolute trust in any of these things is not the wisest decision to make because the fact is that no matter which nation is in power, one day, God's son is going to come down and he's going to rock this world. Put your trust in him. Fourth and finally, yell out to the Father with thanksgiving. Yell out to the Father with thanksgiving. It's very apropos because we're looking to Thanksgiving now. And so let me give you just uh, a few closing thoughts here. Here's the first one. Be thankful that God cares. Be thankful that he cares. 
If you've ever wondered if God cares about you, the psalmist makes it clear that he does. Sure, God looks at creation on an international level. He looks at creation on a universal level. Nevertheless, we cannot help but to get the sense that he also looks on a personal level. Look at verse 18. He says, behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, on those who hope in his steadfast love that he may deliver their soul from death and keep them alive in famine. God thinks much of his creation. God designed our hearts and he gave them to us so that we can give them back to him and worship and praise and to yell out praises and thanksgiving to him. Now, some respond by allowing their hearts uh, to become dismissive or aloof and, and, and as a result, they become standoffish. Uh, they become indifferent towards God. And there's other people who allow their hearts to become hardened against God. And, and when that happens, then you place your confidence in the mortal, visible mankind rather than in the immortal, invisible God. Others respond by allowing their hearts to worship God. And, and that's what he calls for. Hearts that are thankful because they know that God cares. Here's a second thought. Be thankful that God delivers. He delivers. God will deliver the soul that trusts in him. That's, that's what I get from the text. Don't, don't make the mistake of thinking that means that you won't ever go through anything. Don't make the mistake of thinking that uh, that doesn't mean there won't be fires in the West. Or that there won't be flooding in the South. Or that there won't be tornadoes in the Midwest. Some good Christian people whose houses get washed away or torn up uh, by tornadoes. Don't make the mistake of thinking that that means you won't experience hurricanes coming up the East Coast. Don't make the mistake of thinking that uh, that means that you won't experiencing coughing or corona or chronic pain. Some of us know what that's like. That, that's, that's not what he means. At least that's what I've learned. Our faith is not so that we won't go through anything. Our faith is so that when we go through something, we will come out on the other side with our faith still intact. Our faith is so that you won't be shaken. Our faith is so that there's nothing that will stop you from yelling out to God in thanksgiving and worship. Our faith is such that whatever you experience, good or bad or Things that you go through that you just say, I don't even know what to do with that. But your faith remains intact. Be thankful that God delivers. It does not mean that you won't go through anything. It just means that whatever you go through, God will never leave you or forsake you. He's got you. This is then why the psalmist must exclaim what he does in verse 20. He says, our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. For our heart is glad in him because we trust in his holy name. Um, I'm one of those guys who believes in intellectual Christianity. I think that um, far too many uh, Christians um, almost throw away their brains when it comes to their faith. But, but I believe that there's something to be said about study and knowledge, it's important. God would not have given us the ability to acquire knowledge if it was not important. So uh, I'm one of those guys who, who likes intellectual Christianity. Nevertheless, I'm not so much to the extreme of intellectual Christianity that I don't believe that God has not also caused us to be and created us to be emotional beings. That, that he's not caused us and created us to be people who feel something. They used to sing this song at one of the churches in Chicago. Um, went something like this and went, I wouldn't have a religion in the good sense of religion that I couldn't feel sometimes. Sometimes you can't describe it. Sometimes God defies your intellect. 
and he defies your emotions. But yet, the more knowledge that we gain about him, the, the more that we come to feel him in our hearts, the more that we desire to be like him. When we come to know that he is our father, we don't have to address him as sir, yes sir. We address him as Abba, the good, good father. When we come to know that he loves us equally and unconditionally the same, we also come to know we don't have to debate over who loves him the most. And we don't have to debate over which one of us he loves the most because he loves us all the same. And when we come to know that he is God, we also come to know that he is worthy of worship, that he is to be the object of our thanksgiving, that he deserves our praise, that, that he is the one who saves souls and keeps us in the midst of crises, in the midst of difficulty, in the midst of challenges, in the midst of pain. I was listening to a woman this morning who was saying that she had come to a place where she and her husband, their daughter, ran away from home. They couldn't find her. They didn't know where she was. When she finally popped up again, she came back pregnant. And so here she is. They've got this young daughter who's pregnant. And they, you know, they have been praying for her, so there she is at home. She says, in the midst of dealing with this difficult daughter, she comes down with cancer. And she says it just one thing after another. And she says she was laying on her bed in pain, uh, fighting cancer. And she said, Lord... My husband, who was a pastor, and I have been faithful to you. What is going on? What is happening? And out of that experience, she wrote a song called, He's Been Faithful to Me. She says, whenever things went wrong, in so many words, it's a wonderful song if you pull it up. It's sung uh, by the uh, choir in New York. She says, you have always been faithful to me. You have never failed. Well, why should we yell out to the Father in worship? Why should we yell out to him in amazement? Why should we yell out to him for his faithfulness? Why should we yell out to him in thankfulness? Because he's faithful. Because he won't fail. One final little thought here. Yell out to him in hope. Look at verse 22. Let your steadfast love, O Lord, be upon us, even as we hope in you. You have to ask yourself, who is your hope in? Every, amen, God. Every uh, Thanksgiving, um, we will sit around the table. And my wife has a tradition on uh, Thanksgiving dinner and on uh, Christmas dinner. Uh, to ask everyone to share what they're thankful for. And it's a, it should just be a simple time, you know? I mean, really, you know, the thing is, it just strikes me every year, man. Every year I say I'm not going to cry. You know, I'm dead. I'm the man. I'm the captain. Sir, yes, sir. You know? <laughs> and I'm listening to the kids tell about what they're thankful for. Uh, even though the ones that are not walking so close to the Lord, they, they still know who he is and they share what they're thankful for. And they come to me. And there's been a few times I just couldn't get through it. They don't know what I'm thankful for. You know, <laughs> Dad, what are you thankful for? <laughs> What'd he say? What'd he say? I don't know, but he's thankful. You ever have that experience with God? You don't even have words to say. You can't even articulate it. All you know is that he's been faithful to you. He's been good to you. He saved you. He kept you. He brought you through. And you're thankful and you're grateful. So if you don't think of anything else on Thanksgiving as you think about what you're going to buy on Black Friday and all that stuff, 
Don't forget to think about how good and faithful God's been to you. And in that moment, maybe you're in a place where you can't yell out. But in that moment, whether you yell out with your lips, with your voice, or with your heart, yell out. God is good. Shout. I'm thankful to him. And, you know, if you're one of those dancing people, just dance. If you can't dance, please don't. (laughs) Have a happy Thanksgiving. Amen. Thank you.